when we're born, we're as close as we will ever get to being bacteria free. But as soon as we're in the world, we're immediately covered with bacteria. Bacteria from everything we touch, to everyone that touches us. They're on our skin, fighting off infections. In our guts are in our mouths, digesting our food. Most of them are good for us, but they're constantly evolving. They can evolve and keep us healthy, or they can evolve and make us sick. Pinpoint colonies there. See this, this big blue one here? Staphylococci are single-celled organisms. They are bacteria. We have Staph aureus, Staph epidermidis, Staph hominis, Staph hemolyticus. All of these are species of bacteria that we commonly culture from the skin. And they've been with us for a very, very long time. But then we saw the emergence of MRSA. MRSA can infect almost any part of the human body. And infection is really when you start to do damage. So a little cut and MRSA gets into there and can build skin and soft tissue infection. MRSA first showed up in hospitals back in the 50s and 60s, but in the beginning of the 1990s, now all of a sudden MRSA was showing up in the community and became an epidemic. So something happened that allowed MRSA to take off like this. This staff had somehow become optimized for being transmitted between humans and staying on humans once it gets there. Potentially, actually, optimized for being for life on skin. The first thing we did was to look at DNA because bacteria can evolve by acquiring whole sets of genes that have the potential to give them some completely new characteristic instantaneously. So one of the first things we wanted to know was what differences were there between the genomes of the epidemic strain and uh, other closely related staph strains. And you can see that here in this alignment of the two genomes where the, these spaces indicate regions that don't exist in the closest relative but do exist in the epidemic strain which suggests that those areas of the genome were actually acquired from some foreign source, some other strain somewhere else. So when we looked at some of the genes that looked like they had been recently acquired by the epidemic strain, one of the ones that sort of jumped out at us was a gene called SPG. SPG interacts with chemicals on human skin. So we really wanted to know what the real benefit of having the SPG gene was. And the way we get at that is by knocking out the gene. So in essence, actually deleting the SPG gene from the genome and then running side-by-side -side tests with the naturally occurring MRSA and the knockout. We introduced both strains onto human skin cells grown in culture. And by comparing the two, we were able to show that MRSA with the SPG gene could actually survive on skin better. So for us, the central question was really how had MRSA acquired the SPG gene? It turns out that SPG was very similar to genes that other people had seen in a close relative of MRSA called Staph epidermidis. Staph epidermidis is a, an organism that lives on everybody's skin and has been evolving to be optimally suited to live on human skin. Staph epidermidis is certainly there when MRSA comes in. So we think that the Staph epidermidis, some of them died and their DNA was floating around in the medium. And MRSA actively brings that DNA through its membranes to incorporate that DNA then into its genome. So the acquisition of the SPG gene gave, in an instant, 
gave MRSA the ability to survive on the skin better. So these events where some genes get transferred from one organism to another can have profound effects on the epidemiology and on human health. So out there in the community, there are many, many bacterial strains we need to be investigating right now. We live in a place, whether we like it or not, that is full of bacteria. Every time we reach up and hold the subway pole, we're coming into contact with microbes that someone else left there days ago or just a few minutes ago. And we don't understand how these things move around. So we're doing an experiment right now to understand where these bacteria are coming from and where they're going. The first step in preparing this experimental chamber is cleaning it the best that we can. So we clean the walls on the box, so we clean the floor on the box, we filter the air that's going into the box because we're trying to find out just what a human is giving off as they're sitting in a room. Okay, so we're gonna let the room settle down for 10 minutes and then turn the filters on. Good? Okay. So we're collecting air at about shoulder height and near the ground. These cups have a sterile, clean filter right at the base of them. So bacteria that are being sucked in that air are gonna stop at that filter as air moves through. One thing that we know already, just by seeing the first bit of data that we've had back, is that when a human is in a room, we're constantly giving off a lot of bacteria. Every time I breathe, I'm giving out bacteria, and just, you know, wiping my hands, I'm giving off a lot of bacteria. But there's a lot of variability. I have a dog. None of the other two people have a dog that are in this study, and so we might be able to see dog-associated bacteria on my samples. Or we might be able to see that I went for a hike a few days ago and maybe it's still on my clothes. And so now that we understand that there's all these bacteria floating around and that the vast majority of them are not bad for us, the conversation is changing from doing battle with bacteria to actually just managing our bacterial communities in a sensible way. When we knock back the bacteria on our hands with antibiotic hand sanitizer, or when we take antibiotics when we don't need them, we are very likely making room for something else to come in um, and either colonize or actually to invade and affect our health. We will always have bacteria on us. We will always live with bacteria. We can't, in some ways, live without them. So understanding what makes a bacterium good and what makes a bacterium bad and what makes a bacterium benign and what makes it cause disease, those are the crucial questions.